Pastor Bill Evans, Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church, uh, again uh, with Chet TV and thankful to Marlon and company for putting these programs on and so we uh, given this opportunity to share the story of Jesus and his great love. I, uh, some time back, uh, one of these uh, messages, uh, if you've been watching them and following along, uh, talked about uh, the, the man with the borrowed grave and uh, it was about Jesus where he uh, didn't need a grave because he only borrowed one for the weekend from a rich friend. But we talked then that he was uh, crucified, he was uh, killed because of human reasoning. You, you blasphemed, you called yourself the son of God, and, and you can't do that. And what, so uh, they, they crucified him and whatever, but uh, God showed them that uh, it was in his plan. Uh, that Jesus had to die for man's sin. Man, God had been wrong with man's sin. The only way to rectify that sin was he couldn't just make an angel to die for it, whatever. He came in human form and laid his life down on the cross. And uh, that's our theology, we think, from our Bible, what we have. I want us to consider today looking beyond the borrowed tomb. We looked at the borrowed tomb. This is looking beyond it now. And the book of Acts carries us to that story. And there the book of Acts is written by Dr. Luke. And if you read the first chapter, first verses in both counts, you see that's true. But what happens here is uh, we want to consider that looking beyond the borrowed tomb, the first 50 days. And the first 50 days starts off with the 40 and uh, starts off with one. But the 40 days, uh, we see some interesting things happen. But in verse 2 of uh, Acts 1, it says, Until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had he had the Holy Spirit given had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen and to these also he presented himself alive after his suffering um, by many convincing proofs so the first 50 days first off he commands his, his, his apostles to uh, do what they're going to what, what he tells them to do wait on the Holy Spirit and do and we find later Paul would write that the the foundation of the Christian church is up, based upon the apostles and the prophets. How we think that it is real in our theology is that if an apostle makes an interpretation of the Old Testament, then that apostolic teaching is the final word because they have the Spirit of God and given that freedom and that wisdom there from God as God uh, led them. So here we have them, um, uh, the apostles are, are given these commands and he says, to these he presented himself alive after his sufferings with many convincing proofs. What's a convincing proof? It means that you've accomplished something. Guess what? Right now in our world, the Olympics are going on. We just won a gold medal, and this little girl from Canada is the most decorated Canadian uh, so far in the, in the Summer Olympics. That medal shows she's accomplished something. That medal proves she's accomplished something. And so there uh, is many convincing proofs. This is the proof here. As you go through your Bible, you find interesting proofs about uh, Jesus and the fact that he was raised and, and, uh, and all that he'd done. So here in the 40 days, uh, in verse 3, we're told what he did. He says, To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. God, Jesus wanted his disciples to learn things about what was happening in the world in which he lived. They lived. And so many kingdom training, things that they should be doing for God. Uh, while they, he hasn't left yet, but he's going to leave. And while he's gone, he wants them to pay attention. So he commands them. And, and uh, here uh, he, he, the command is given for them, stay put. And we see that throughout scriptures time and again, time and again. Stay, remain, be quiet, be still and know that I'm God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the, what the Father had promised, which he says... John baptized with water. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, wait. Hardest thing in the world sometimes as Christians is to wait. Uh, God, that's one of God's answers to prayer. Yes, no, or wait later. And uh, his parents raising children, uh, wait. A little friend one time, she said, I come home from school and I say to mom, can I have a sandwich? She says, mom says, supper's at five. I didn't ask what time supper was. I asked if I could have a sandwich. And uh, waiting is what God told his disciples, Jesus told his disciples to do. stay put. And then look at verse 6 and 7 there. If you had your Bible, it says there, so when they come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. I wrote a note in my Bible here, notes here, it says this, do not major on minors, 
because if you do, the minors become the major. Do not major on minors because the minors become the major. Jesus says the end time stuff, leave it, it'll happen. It's going to be it's prophesied, it's going to be fulfilled. All scripture is going to be fulfilled. Don't spend a whole lot of time looking there, whatever. Spend your time serving and loving Jesus. The, um, the parable of the ten virgins and such like. Him. In verses 9 and 10 of Luke 1, we see here a jaw-dropping ascension. After these things, he was lifted up while he's telling them to uh, stay there in Jerusalem until they receive the Holy Spirit. There's that wait program. And after this, he said to them, he was lifted up one. While they were looking on, a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they're standing there looking up and down, this is a, a very special verse to my heart. As they're gazing intently into the sky, well, while he was going, behold, two angels, two men in white clothing, stood beside them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into the sky? You better shut your mouth there because you get flies in them. They're sitting there just awestruck that Jesus is just lifted off the ground. He's going out of their sight. And the angels say, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come again in the way you saw him go. Just as you've watched him go. Then they returned. The lights came on. Jesus is left, and he's got a plan for what he wants his people to do. The angels told him that, the men in white. says, this Jesus has been taken up. He's coming back. The parables Jesus told, when the Son of Man leaves, you've got duty. And he says, you're waiting for the bridegroom to come. Then be busy. Make sure you've got oil. Make sure you're serving. And make sure that if he shows up in a moment and twinkling of an eyes, he says he will, you're not doing something that you would regret. And so live holy um, and, 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 and serve him is what he wants his people to do. So after the jaw-dropping uh, ascension, um, uh, this question is, why do you stand there looking? Get active and do what he wants you to do. And you find your Bible and the New Testament and read it. And the Gospel of John and these things. What does Jesus tell me to do? Uh, new commandment, love one another. Care for one another. Care for others. Uh, and, and, and be on the lookout to help others. Uh, that's what he wants you to do. Uh, so go back, he said to them, and wait in verse 12. So they went back and they waited. And then... Uh, there's some other things. While I'm waiting, well, we should clean house. We should do some housekeeping. Somebody got the idea, help of God, that the, uh, we, uh, Judas is missing. We're missing an apostle. We're missing an apostle. Uh, the, the, the head guys, the head leaders, the disciples. Uh, one of the 12 is missing. We should replace him. And so they, they got together, and in verse 14, you find right there in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, it says um, uh, These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and, uh, and of his brothers. And at this time, Peter stood up in the midst, gathering about 120 persons was there. And he says, Brethren, Scripture has to be fulfilled. The Holy Scripture foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. We need to replace him. So they sat down, they discussed it together. And they replaced Judas for uh, his part of betraying Jesus. Sad, isn't it, that Jesus says, on the night in which he was betrayed in our communion service, we always read that, I very often read that. And for Paul wrote that, in the night in which Jesus was betrayed. The Passover supper, there was, a, there was a bitter herb that had to be eaten. And somebody said that bitter herb in the Christian faith is the remembrance that it was on the night in which he was betrayed that somebody would actually betray the Holy Son of God, the man who did nothing but good, and somebody betrayed him. They hung him on a cross and they spit in his face. They pulled his hair and they, they beat him. They mocked him, all those things, this Holy Lamb of God. But it was the night in which he was betrayed. Somebody dipped his hand in the dish with him and, uh, and, and uh, was, was bold enough to do that. That man was Judas. They, in housekeeping, they replaced him. They continued in prayer and supplication there with the women and Jesus, Jesus' brothers and his mom and those, whatever. Judas is replaced. And then in chapter 2, um, they uh, starts off the chapter 2, and that's that famous chapter in the Bible. Forty days, Jesus showed himself uh, to the disciples. And uh, uh, he says, wait until whatever. So in 40 days, so they got, this is, uh, Pentecost is happening. That's 50 days in. So what's that? If you're good at math, 10 days they had to wait after Jesus ascended, it seems. 10 days. And so here all of a sudden, boom, Pentecost Sunday is here. 
And what happens? Well, they have all these uh, illustrations of flames on the people and whatever. And, and people are hearing people. There's all kinds, we're told there's all kinds of people there, but they all heard the gospel in their own language. And that, that's quite a, a, a concept that they're all hearing them speak in their own language in verse 6. Uh, Jews from all over the world were there and they, hep, they kept hearing uh, their, the gospel and the message about Jesus in their own language. And verse 38 of that chapter carries away way over and it goes on. And um, again, I like giving folks homework. Read chapter 2 of Acts, Acts 1 and 2 for homework. And here you find a wonderful verse in verse 38, uh, and 7 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Peter told them that they were guilty of killing Jesus. He's talking to the Jewish leaders. He says, you guys are guilty of killing Jesus. Jesus, what? We haven't done that. He said, yes, you are. You're dead guilty. And, and God used you guys by standing back and withholding grace. He let you hang up the, son, the Lamb of God, the Son of Glory, and uh, hang him up on a cross. And, and light started to come on because the Holy Spirit was moving. And these people started to realize, well, what, what do we do, Peter? What do we do? And he used these words. And my friend, this is the story of the gospel. Whenever you find yourself in a mess, then turn to Jesus and say, forgive me, turn around, face him, and ask him to forgive you. You see, the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save that which was lost. When you find yourself in a lost situation, a hurtful situation, repent. And then, he says, repent and then be baptized in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, baptism, we see it as an identification. It's an outward expression of an act that's gone on in your heart. I've repented. Uh, I've, uh, we, use, we use an immersion mode where we go down in the water and come back up. And we say, I've died to myself. I'm not living for me. I'm living for Jesus with his help and with his grace. Repent, he says. Turn from your way. Ask forgiveness. And Jesus is always listening when we do that. So repent. Each one of you be baptized in the name. And then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's obedience, and Jesus likes us to be obedient. And as we are obedient, he will come alongside us. He'll meet us. He'll help us in living our life for him. And then he says this, verse 39, For the promises for you and your children, and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord himself will call. And then down there in verse 41, it says, That day, 3,000 people. That's as many people, by and large, the bigger part of Chetwind. Um, and uh, they came to know the Lord that day. The souls were added to them. People turning from their sin and saying, I need Jesus to forgive me my sin. 3,000 in one day. That's pretty wild. Then right after that, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and to prayer. And uh, with all that, they kept having favor with the people and with God, and um, there they were. Um, Jesus... Board the tomb for the weekend. After that, all these things were done. Uh, ministered, 500 people saw him, Corinthians says, ministered, wait, and as they waited, Pentecost happened, and there they were. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Mm -hmm.